the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we get a threefer. It's a pretty good deal. You came to church for one sermon, you get three rolled up into one. It's kind of like the Trinity except different. Same idea, different concept. That doesn't make any sense on purpose. Today we look into the kingdom of heaven through the eyes of Jesus. In one passage we get three parables. I always love the storytelling. He gives us three stories in short snippets, yet it's more than we could comprehend in a week, maybe even more. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. If you're rooting around out here in Mount Olive and you find some buried gold or something like that, you are more than welcome to make us an offer of oh, five, six million dollars for the property. It's a little bit high, but you're welcome to it. And uh, we'll take your money. You can have the treasure and we'll build a newer, nicer church somewhere in a neighborhood with a parking lot. And we'll have air conditioning too. You see, but that's the way that this guy is thinking, right? I find a treasure in a field. I'm going to bury it again. Don't tell anyone. I'll get rock bottom prices. And then everything on the field is mine too. So he goes. He buys the field. And in his joy, he has his treasure. So the moral of the story is sell everything that you have and give it to the church. And of course, you will be happy, wealthy, and wise for the rest of your life, right? No. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. We always think that these parables are about us, don't we? We always think that we're the guy who finds the treasure in the field. And of course, the treasure is Jesus, right? And so we bury him after we crucify him or something crazy like that. And now we're, we're wonderful people because we found our treasure you found nothing. While you were dead in your sins and trespasses, God found you in Christ Jesus. Is it hard to believe for you as it is for me? Is it as hard for you to believe that we're the treasurer? We're the treasurer. And Jesus is the one who sells all in order to have us. He sells everything. He gives his life in order to have you. Now that's crazy talk, isn't it? But it's true. Jesus has joy of you. You are the apple of his eye. You are the treasure of his field. You're it. Now that you've been purchased with a price, the price of his life, his death, and his resurrection, he holds you near and dear to his heart, and he says, you are mine. I pay dearly for you. Jesus and the kingdom of heaven have claimed you. And when you've been claimed by Jesus, he claims all of you, your whole life, including your death and your resurrection. On the last day when you buy the farm, so to speak, I pray that you will have joy of knowing that you have been bought and all of you, your sin, your righteousness, Everything has been paid for and redeemed in Christ. He has claimed you to be the greatest treasure of all. See, isn't this great when we stop making it all about us, how it's all about God? And then when Jesus does all these things, he does them for us? It's not about you going out and finding Jesus. It's not about you and your righteousness purchasing God or atoning for your sins, or atoning for your unrighteousness. Instead, God atones for your sin and your unrighteousness. But Jesus keeps driving the point home, doesn't he? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. We've talked before, I think maybe... How long ago now? Three, six years ago about how pearls are made and someone corrected me. I really don't know how it all works, but from what I understand, the pearl is, is something that gets caught basically in the clam's throat. It, it, 
for lack of a better anatomy, I guess. And something gets in there and it, it keeps kind of making this mucusy kind of stuff that keeps coating it and coating it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time, and that's a pearl. It's interesting how God works. The longer the oyster has that irritant, the bigger the pearl gets. Jesus uses a pearl as the gem of choice. And I find that this is ironic because left to our own devices, left to our own righteousness and our own sense of how good we are, we're nothing but an irritant. Before a righteous God, we have no righteousness to offer in and of ourselves. If you think you're a good person apart from Christ, you're wrong. You're an irritant. You're bugging him, and you're bugging me too. Of course, you might be bugging me anyway, but that's just my problem, not yours. Jesus, in his mercy, through holy baptism, his word attached to the water, here he comes to us and takes little pieces of dirt and he coats us with his righteousness. He puts a luster on us. The longer we're in the faith, the more we hear the word and receive the sacraments, the more we know his salvation for us and the more that that luster builds more and more every day. When we come to God's house and we hear the words of absolution, we see the font there before us and we have joy knowing I'm a redeemed child of the living God. There he baptized me. He washed me. He made me clean. He clothed me with his righteousness and he invites me to his altar where I can dine and I can partake of Christ himself and his righteousness for me. There we are made larger and larger in the faith. We diminish, but it's Christ that keeps increasing on us and in us and for us and to us. And the pearl gets larger. Finally, on that last day, we are the most precious jewel, each and every one of us. These parables aren't about us giving all that we have so that we might possess Jesus, but it's about Jesus giving all that he has so that he might possess us. And how does he possess us? But with his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. That's what kind of Jesus we have. When we have joy of being possessed by Jesus, we see that all of our possessions and desires to have possessions are worthless in comparison. When we truly meditate on the goodness of Christ for us, what are the riches of this world in comparison? If you're lucky, you'll live to be 80, 90, maybe these days 100 years old. And in the end, you leave the world just like you came in naked and crying. What is it if you have billions of dollars, yet you have not Christ? Or better yet, He has not you. Worthlessness. Vanity. After all said and done, Jesus has claimed us to be His pearls of great price. We find that he is our treasure beyond all else. In the end, if we think that we'll be saved by reaching into our pockets and offering up to our God our costume jewelry of good works, our talents, our skills, our merits, we'll be lost. But if we claim Jesus, claim Jesus as our crown jewel, the Father will proclaim us to be his pearls bought with that great price the price of his son's life, the price of his death, the price of his resurrection. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore, 
Then they sat down and collected the good, the good fish in baskets and threw the bad fish away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Jesus said that his, fishermen, his, or rather his disciples would be fishers of men, or should I say his fishermen disciples will become fisher of men, he wasn't talking about little bottom fishing here, you know, throwing your line out in the lake and waiting for a bass to jump on or something like that. Instead, he's talking about trolling nets, dragging nets through the water and catching fish in abundance. They were not sent to snag fish one at a time by dangling some, mor- some tasty morsel before them, but instead by dragging a net, pulling everything in that they can. The church is here to pull as many in as we can. Not to lure people through the door by pretending to give them something tasty and delightful, but rather simply inviting them in. No bait and switch in the Lord's house. Net fishing is the way of the kingdom. We pull you in, we tell you about Jesus, we baptize you, we catechize you. It's indiscriminate. You don't pick and choose the fish that you want to catch. You just throw the net. And you see what you get. Good fish, bad fish, they all get stuck in the net. Sometimes an old tennis shoe, beer bottle. You never know what you're going to pull in. The sorting plate takes place at the end, Jesus tells us. When the nets hauled to shore, the fishermen sit down with their buckets and they make judgments as to which is a keeper and which isn't. In this case, the fishermen are the angels. Those who do the sorting, rather, are the angels. They're the ones who sit down with God's criterion of Christ Jesus, and they do the sorting. We, the church, don't dare to sort the believers from the unbelievers. You may be a true believer in Christ and have a terrible addiction to drugs or alcohol. You may be a very upright citizen and put all your faith in yourself and none in Christ. The addict gets into heaven. The Pharisee gets tossed into the fire. That final and ultimate judgment is reserved for God and the angels, not for us. Now, if you're here acting like a pagan, we're told in the scriptures to treat you like a pagan. That means you need to be evangelized more, maybe. If you're causing division in the church, or if you're showing up and just kind of really acting out poorly, we have to treat you like you don't believe, because you're acting like you don't believe. If you walk like a duck and quack like a duck and look like a duck, you might be a duck. But it's not our place to declare, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, or anything like that. That's not my place. I am a minister of the gospel. And the gospel says Christ has called all of you to himself to be his precious jewels today. He doesn't want any of you to perish. Finally, Jesus says, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. I think our ESV says every scribe. You see, that's the word of God. It brings out all the treasures. We have no God except for the one that we know in Scripture, and that one is revealed to us in Christ Jesus. We bring out the Old and the New, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we find that it's all about Jesus from the beginning to the end. We were talking about that in Bible class this morning. Adam and Eve were saved looking forward to Jesus. We're saved looking back to Jesus. The cross is that place and time where the salvation of the world is accomplished. 
whole of the Old Testament, whole of the New Testament, all about Jesus, all Jesus, all the time, 24-7. Today, the treasure chest of the Lord is open to you. We have joy of the liturgy, which is ancient and yet new. We have the joy of the Lord who brings us the gifts of his body and blood for us. The Ancient of Days has come and made himself new to us in Holy Communion. We have joy of Holy Baptism, the living water, which is always new, and yet existed before all of time. We have absolution, the brilliance of our Savior, who proclaims that forgiveness onto us and into us, that every day we might hear it brand new and believe once again that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Today, Jesus gives you all of himself with joy. He claims you to be his most prized treasure, and he is yours. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us take our eyes off of ourselves. Let us stop thinking that it's all about us. But instead, let us know beyond all doubt that in spite of our best intentions, Jesus forgives us for his sake 